All right, let's go. Welcome, everybody, to this week's edition of Don Cherry's Grapevine Podcast. Dad, Cindy, you're taking a little bit of time off, so we're going to do something, again, a little bit different. Last week, uh, Dad and Cindy and I talked about Brian Kilray, the winningest coach in junior hockey and one of Dad's best friends and teammate in Springfield with the uh, infamous Eddie Shore. So we're going to run a Grapevine show that we did in 1990 where Dad and Brian talk about Eddie Shore and some of the shenanigans that went on. That night we did three shows, if it's hard to believe, we'd be doing the Grapevine show. And they were aired on TSN at the time. We did uh, the first show was Ron Ellis, the uh, famous uh, Toronto Maple Leaf. And then we did uh, Don Lever, who many people don't right, might not remember, but played 15 years in the National Hockey League. And uh, that year, when we did it in 1990, he was made head coach of the Rochester Americans, like Dad. And that year, he won Coach of the Year, just like Dad. So doing three shows in one night, that was a lot on Dad's plate. But uh, Brian Kilray was one of the easier uh, interviews Dad will have, as you'll see. They'll just say, remember when. And uh, they talk like this for hours every time they got together. But before we get going, we'd like to thank our sponsor, Spreads.ca. They're a Canadian-owned online casino and sportsbook. And if you sign up now and use the promo GRAPES, you get 10 spins on the big wheel. They match your deposit up to $250. And on your first sports bet, they'll spot you 25 bucks. So we like to thank them for all their support over the years. So without further ado, Don Cherry's Grapevine with Brian Kilray. This week of the Grapevine, we got the coach of the Ottawa 67s, my buddy Brian Kilray. Let's go. Nice. Oh, yeah. Timely favorite, like I said, Roddy Ellis, right there. <laughs> and Donnie Lever, right there from Vancouver, Buffalo, Atlanta, and Calgary, right there. <laughs> and punching for their pop. And coaching the Rochester Americans right now. Tell us about it. Well, I just uh, got the job this summer. Very excited about it. Got my own ship. Yeah. And I look at your picture every day. I know. Don't I have a lot of hair back then? You did back then. Listen, let me tell you. uh, You had some great coaches before you. Mike Keenan, Coach of the Year. That's right. Coach of the Year. (laughs) Twice as Coach of the Year. I got to go through that to get into announcing, though, right? And on TV, I got to go through... Coach, well, first you get fired a few times? You gotta get fired and then you go. And you, go. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's a funny thing how all, uh, um, uh, I say, all good coaches come up through the, you, if you look at the records of all the coaches in the National Hockey League, they all come through the American Hockey League. Is that right? That's right. That's where I want to learn it. And uh, you were assistant coach and you were tired of picking up pucks, right? That's right. You got it. <laughs> How'd this, you know? <laughs> I know, I know. I, I remember when I went for Team Canada, the Harry Sinden says, okay, you can go and help Scotty. Bowman, I don't want to ever see a Boston Bruin picking up pucks out of the net, so I never did. But this guy here, Brian Kilray, I've known him so long. He, uh, I think back in the 50s we got together in a place called Springfield Indians. Probably uh, the Darth Vader of hockey, Eddie Shore, was there. And I, when we were there, nobody wanted to go to Springfield. Everybody. In fact, they had it in their contract. Uh, cannot go to Springfield because you were sent there to be punished. This guy come up from the Troy Bruins, I don't know what the hell league it was, he was happy. And all of Eddie, and Eddie Shore had us all want to sit down and skate like this with our knees bent, eh? This guy comes up perfect. He was his cat, oh, he loved him. He loved this guy. And, our, and a lot of people don't realize he was a guy that started the uh, Players Association. 
Uh, sure, we had a great idea of suspending guys for indifferent play, even if they hadn't played in a month. It's suspended. <laughs> he suspended uh, three guys. That's yeah, a true story. If the, if the contracts got a little high, just suspend them, different play. Um, he uh, suspended three guys, and uh, that was the final straw. And he loved Brian. He absolutely loved Brian. And Brian went in, stuck up for these guys, was a spokesman. He got suspended too. They brought in Alan Eagleson. I remember Bob, I was there. There was anything we played them that night. It was they were going on strike. First time hockey ever went on strike. Sold it. So Brian is the uh, responsible for the Players Association, uh, high salaries and agents. And does he hate agents? I'll tell you. A great guy. One of the smartest guys I've ever met. The other, there's two. There's two other guys that I've through my career that I've met have been smart. One was Al Miller, an old goalie. Some of you guys remember he's in a bad car accident. This guy knew everything. Dave Hodge. Dave Hodge, and I'm telling you, this guy knew everything, but the top of them all was Brian Kilray, and we'll be right back with Brian, and don't you go away! Another Ottawa guy here, Ronnie Ellis. Yeah, it's nice to have it. Now, where's Jimmy McKenney to make the hat trick? Oh, he'd be a hat trick. Oh, right. he is funny, isn't he? <laughs> you have a room with Jimmy? Yeah, that's all he wrote with Jimmy <laughs> just once in those days. Jimmy broke a lot of guys in. Yeah. Me. <laughs> well, we've come a long way, eh, from Springfield? Yeah, it's great, isn't it? Uh, but I guess you do miss some of those trips that we used to have. And um, when Eddie would give you $3 a day to eat. $3. Yeah, $3. That was, uh, no, remember, I know it's a while back. But remember the couple of guys we, we saw their team meal? We won't talk about it. Oh. 19 cents are eating the 19 cents hamburgers. Remember we used to have those, I think it was White's Big Burgers. White Towers. White Towers, yeah. yeah. And yeah. they were in, we had the pregame meal, and we went just had a big steak, which cost more than our one, our meal money. And these fellows came out of there, and they were, one had to be on my line. I was starting to get a little worried for that. Yeah, night. the buggers, they went to the National League <laughs> yeah. and we stayed in the yeah. Springfield. Well, that's how smart they were and how smart we were. Yeah, anyhow. <laughs> yeah, well, where are they now? Yeah. All right. They're probably uh, watching you. Yeah, listen. <laughs> 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 All right, I want to get back. Born and raised in Ottawa, right? Yeah. Now, I know something nobody else knows. This guy, when he was 15, looked about 10, right? and you were a pool hustler. Tell us about that, a real pool hustler. You're looking at this guy right here. Well, I'll tell you, the, um, I did, I enjoyed pool, and uh, I learned it well. And I didn't, uh, for a few years, I never had a job, so that um, I quit school. I graduated early and, uh, from school. <laughs> and uh, so I started uh, taking pool serious, along with hockey. And uh, I'll never forget when I came back, I came up to uh, junior, matter of fact, in Hamilton, play for the Tire Cubs with Jimmy Skinner. And there was a couple of fellows around the team that was older than I was, but uh, they had played pool as well. And after a couple of weeks and a couple of sessions, uh, Jimmy came to me and he said, uh, you better not play pool anymore. Some of the guys are getting mad. And when I went pro, uh, when I came back in the summer, I never got a job. I uh, played pool for a living. And uh, my wife thought it would be nice if I went and got a job at a lesser pay so she could tell everyone what I worked at through the <laughs> summer. And that's a true story. I uh, got to enjoy the game. Well, listen, yeah, but let's tell a story when you were 15, when the guy used to pick you up and you used to go to other cities. You oh, didn't yeah. want to tell that one? Tell it. Yeah, there was a fellow, his name was Poli, and it's a true story. Uh, he started watching me play, and he thought it was pretty good. So he'd come down and pick me up, and uh, he'd take me to different pool rooms around the valley. And because I looked uh, young and looked... Uh, easy some of the uh, fellows would come around and say hey kid you want to shoot a game for a couple of bucks or whatever and in those days we we're talking back in the yeah. late 40s and uh, I'd say yeah I'll play and so uh, he would tell me when I uh, should try and when I should uh, take it easy just like in the movie it was a true story and uh, he drove me around and he'd always bring me back so my parents didn't have to worry about me coming home late he'd bring me back and at the end of the day I couldn't be a loser because if we won he gave me something for playing. If we lost, he said, well, you learned. So I was fortunate. So besides a hockey player, I got to know that side of the uh, life, the gambling part, which has really helped me when I went on to hockey, because you gamble in hockey as well with coaching. Oh, geez. You know the thing I was really happy about? I'll never forget this. We were at training camp, and I don't know how we were with Cheevers, but we were with Cheevers. Was, I guess it was Rochester, eh? Or yeah. wherever it was. 
Uh, you know, the NHL guy, St. Cheever, is a great guy, but he really thought he was really something, eh? So I knew you played pool really good, and I says, uh, he was cleaning everybody, and I said, Brian, why don't you play Cheever? I said, geez, yeah, let's go here, eh? And remember, you, you let him win right till, how did you do that, um, remember? No, we just had a, it was an easy game. We had uh, an easy game uh, for the fun of it to see, because uh, I wanted to find out uh, really how good he was. I didn't want to embarrass you or myself. And uh, then I found that I, I thought I could beat him, so... Um, we uh, we had a serious game after that, and uh, I think it was just for a round of coke. Oh, yeah. <laughs> awesome. Pepsi. That reminds me of the other story about your friend, uh, the late Red Armstrong, where we had the Uber games. We used to, uh, gee, we, they were serious. Tell it, quick, hurry that one up and tell that. Talk about serious, folks. Never mind the hockey game that night. Euchre games, look out. Go yeah, ahead. Don and I were partners, and he knew I loved Euchre. And it's, uh, so we went down. We're on the bus this day. We we're playing cards. And finally, he says, well, we've got a big challenge. We're into town. You've got to, uh, oh. You're going to be my partner against Tom Real McCarthy murder. and Red Armstrong. And Don says, Brian, you've got to be really sharp. You've got to be really sharp. Anyone to this restaurant that uh, served malts. And, uh, I and remember, a few pints. Yeah, I remember that. And uh, so Don said, no, you can't have any. I said, hold it, Don. I'm all right. End up after the third trick. Uh, we found that Red had forgot to play a card one time, and I said, Red, Way back. Yeah, I said, Red, uh, you misplayed a uh, card. He says, No, no, I didn't. I said, Yeah, look at that trick. So all of a sudden, Don looked at me and says, Bring him another drink. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was allowed to have a drink as long as I stayed sharp. Tom McCarthy was the, the other partner. That's right. Let me tell you something about Tom McCarthy. Not many people have known Tom McCarthy. If Tom McCarthy was playing today, he'd be making a million bucks. Am I right? Yeah, he's a, he was almost like Bob Probert, a big, tough, easygoing guy. Meter with got, the stick. When you got him mad, uh, like the story was, I know the opposition because we played with Tom, but he also played against us. The story was that don't wake him up because Ooh. if you do, dynamite. Uh, unbelievable. I, I, I know guys that used to go out. Daryl Sly and I used to play together all the time. We used to go out and ask him how his family was, how he's doing. Yeah. I'm telling you, he was the toughest guy. 50 goals he got in the EPHL, and it was, you know, in the old days, they bring him up, and he killed penalties. I mean, that's yeah. the way they were in the old days. Unbelievable, but that guy was some hockey Yeah, player. and a great guy, too. He, oh, yeah. Matter of fact, he came down to Toronto to see me a couple of years ago when the last year of the Marlies, and he came down to say hello. Blackjack Tom. Now, you were the only guy ever happy to go to shore. Yeah, I, I chose it. Matter you chose fact, to go yeah, to shore? Because I was I like chose to go to Devil's Island. <laughs> <laughs> As it turned out that uh, I was in Troy, Ohio, and, uh, what league was that? International League. And Eddie Short came down to scout us. And um, our goaltender got hurt in one of the games. So I put the pads on and finished the game. They only got one goal against me in the half a game. And then the next game, I was back as a forward and <coughs> got a couple of goals. So I guess Eddie saw both and figured this guy must be nuts. He deserves to be in Springfield. So he came down and he, he offered me a contract. But what happened was the guy in Troy, I was the uh, most valuable player. And he, I was supposed to get a diamond ring for being the most valuable player as well as one of the lowest paid players. And uh, I always carried that on because I was end up that way with Eddie. Uh, but anyway, he didn't give me the ring because I had won it the year before. And I said, that's fine. Then I won't sign with you next year. I took a cut to go to Springfield. Jeez, what a cut. I was quite a businessman. Jeez, yeah, you, know what I mean. <laughs> you, you, you play, you skated. Just that, like he wanted guys to skate. He wanted you to skate like you were sitting in a chair with your backside behind your skates and this way here, the hands out in front of you. And I was a good disciple because I did skate sort of funny. And he thought it was great. Oh, he, you, you were the favorite son. Tell us a few of his exercises. Well, he'd get you on the ice. And uh, one that he did with me, uh, I'll never forget the first year I joined the team. And it really uh, left an impression so much that I still remember it. He put a stick down the back of my sweater, so I had to skate that way. He taped my hands and my gloves to my stick with just the width of my body, not quite as wide as it is now. In those days, it was a little thinner body, but your hands were taped to your stick here. And then he put a lace around my knee so I couldn't take a long stride, and he said, skate. Well, as it turned out, I could skate, because it I, was perfect. I just used to take those short, choppy strides anyway, and so actually he was mad because I could do it right off the bat, and he started making me do turns. And that's when I, when I was trying to do those fancy turns, I fell. Then I got mad and I threw my stick, but I forgot my gloves were with. Yeah. <laughs> How about Georgie Wood? Georgie Woods, a poor guy. Georgie, uh, I don't know how he ended up staying there and taking the abuse that he did. He never played a game or very seldom played, but he kept a cheery note and he was always a good team man. Remember how he kept him from going down? Yes. With the rope? With the rope, yeah. Yeah, tell nice, uh, yeah when they used to, uh, Eddie devised a way to keep goaltenders standing up. Uh, I think it was the old ox, the Bobby Sr. that was the first. The ox, Bobby Sr. They put the uh, rope around the neck and then tied it to the goalpost and said, now go down. <laughs> Goaltenders are smart. They knew when not to fall. <laughs> remember Pat Egan? You remember the day? Were you there the day I broke my stick over the coach? I was on the uh, Black Ace uh, scene with you that day, Don. You were my partner. And I uh, remember, 
he gave you a two-handed slash, and you came back and I said, I'll get him. I said, no, no, because he's a coach. He said, I don't care. And I don't, Pat Egan was really strong, and he oh, came, yeah. came by, and Don gave him a two-handed cross-check, broke a stick over his shoulder. That's he never guy. wore pads. No, he was a tough guy. And he, you broke it. Not there, that tough, though. No, <laughs> I, I thought you were gone, but that came later. <laughs> Yeah, the next day, next day I ended up in Three Rivers. I got, a, I got a story. It reminds me of Pat Egan, since you brought up Pat Egan. But one year we had played in Buffalo in the middle of winter. And I know an awful lot of you people know this fellow. Floyd Smith was my winger, and he was on the bus. It's a true story. Anyway, uh, one of the players didn't make the bus call. And it's 9 o'clock, we're leaving for, to go to Hershey. And as it turned out, it was Bill Sweeney, and he had just missed the bus call. And anyway, Pat, yeah, well, he sometimes uh, missed him because he was having a late coffee. <laughs> anyway, as he turned out, he, uh, he, Pat said, okay, I'm going to go get him. And so you guys wait here. So naturally, we're all on the bus waiting to go to Hershey. Well, as it turned out, we all had our coats off ready for the card game because it's going to be an eight-hour trip of which we were going to receive a dollar and a half for lunch. <laughs> anyway, the, uh, as he left, Floyd Smith uh, just happened to say, well, I'm going to go get a couple of coffees. There's a little restaurant right around the corner. No, I'll tell you what it was. Keep your train of thought. I was sitting there. He says, grapes, I'm going in to get a big Coke. Remember, he used to drink the big Cokes, but go ahead. Yeah, and anyway, he says, I'm just going to go away, so just watch out for me and don't leave. Anyway, as it turned out, he goes around the corner to this little store. Now, across the street comes Pat uh, helping Bill Sweeney. He got the bag and everything. It was actually like the movies because when he went to pack, I guess some of the... Some of the, uh, the didn't really close and he just banged it and the clothes were hanging out. We thought it was actually comical. So when he got on the bus, Bill was a natural funny guy. Anyway, he comes down the aisle and says, let's get the cards going. So everyone really forgot about Floyd. Yeah. And so we're, we just took off. Egan says, let's get this bus rolling. Now Floyd comes out of the restaurant in the middle of winter with short sleeve shirts on this, a true short sleeve sleeve show. That's an easy one. But anyway, short sleeves and he's standing there. I thought it was a coffee, but anyway, whether it was a Coke or not. And he thought it was a joke that the bus was just going to go around the block and come back and pick him up. And he told us later, after a half an hour, he knew it wasn't a joke. <laughs> he, he walked over to the Buffalo Arena, and uh, Freddie Hunt was a general manager yeah. in those days. He walked over to the arena, asked Freddie would he loan us some money, he had to fly down to catch the team in Hershey, but he had to fly to Harrisburg and then taxi over to Hershey. He got there ahead of us all right, but the funniest line is when he went to the airport, now he's all frozen and he's cold and he's everything else and he's mad and now he's broke. And he went to the airline ticket, and the, the girl says, yes, where are you going? Got a ticket? Yeah. She says, do you have any luggage? Floyd says, do you think I'd be walking around in the middle of winter if I had any luggage to check? <laughs> so, uh, that was one of the stories about poor Floyd that uh, I always felt bad that someone forgot him. Yeah, and he told me. Uh, listen, uh, Pat, remember Pat Egan on the thing? We're going along. All of a sudden, we hit a partridge. You remember that? Yeah. Tell that story. And everybody was fighting for the partridge because they're all going to say, I'll get it cooked, I'll get it cooked. Finally, uh, as a glass flew into the yeah, seats, it's a true smash story, just whole... smash it. Luckily it caught the second one and not the one by the driver. Flew right in, cracked the window and everything else, and here's this partridge laying there. Anyway, everybody was saying, oh, I'll have a big feast, we'll have a partridge dinner, whatever. <laughs> Pat Egan put it in his bag. He took it home and cooked it. He never even passed around anyone. But he took it to a chef, and that's the truth. The chef says, you Eat can't the... cook that. He says, there's glass all through that partridge. He was going to take that. That's the way Pat was. No wonder he sent me to Three Rivers in Jersey. Shore, Shore used to love to twist necks. Remember, he thought he was a chiropractor. Yeah, and if you didn't allow him, I'll never forget the one night uh, he called me down and he said, uh, it was a Friday night, we always played Saturday, and he said, uh, I want to see you. Oh, I said, I, finally I'm getting traded. It's a Friday night at 10.30. Like, I'm going to be traded. So I went down to the rink and the rink is in darkness. And anyway, I found my way naturally through those eight years of being there. I found my way to the dress room, there's Shore in there, and he says, get on the table. I said, for what? He says, I want to crack your back and your neck. And I said, I'm not letting you crack my back, and there's nothing wrong with me. He said, I noticed the way you're skating today, get on there, and he said, uh, or go home, and he says, you're not playing tomorrow. And I said, well, I'm not getting on the table, so I went back home, and here Judy was waiting, thinking, should she pack, because am I traded? No, I just wasn't getting my neck cracked, went down the next day, and at the time, I was one of our leading scorers at the team, one of them. Bill Sweeney was always there, too. And uh, I wasn't allowed to play that night. The trainer came to me, Wally Barlow. He says, Brian, um, you're not playing tonight. I said, why? He said, because you wouldn't let Shore crack your neck. Oh, I well. had to let Shore crack my back and my neck Remember in front of the team so I could play that night. How about Bob McCord ruined his back? Bobby walked with an S. 
but he, he felt good though because <laughs> then he told him you're really healthy now walked in a nest I remember he was twisting like that, he was twisting like that, twisting a guy like that, and Denny Olson was there, and he's twisting, we're all watching, it's all quiet, and Denny says, do any of those things ever come off yeah. in your head? Did any of the, and that Eddie's hands, he had big, thick fingers, just like that. Yeah. And it, he was grabbing his head, and he was pulling up, and that's what Denny Olson said, did one of those ever come off in your hand, Ed? <laughs> <laughs> and I'll tell you, Eddie Shore, so serious, so sincere, he just turned around, he was just venom. And he just turned around and he said to Olsen, he said, did you say something? Everyone else broke up. Like, yeah. how could you not laugh yeah. at that line? Yeah. It was a great line. Yeah. Except Jock, Jock Caron, he came, I, th I told you this before, he, Jock Caron came about 6'1". He left 6'3 and a half. Eddie just had that neck stretch. <laughs> <laughs> Remember the time we were in the Empire Hotel and, and uh, Floyd Smith and I, we were having a few beers and that, and uh, Audrey come outside blowing the horn? Yeah, and uh, unfortunately, uh, Floyd, uh, Floyd got one of these. Yeah, he went out and Audrey, boy, are we going to get it. Sorry, Audrey, but we're telling the story. And she hit him with a, uh, with a oh, high heel, yeah, blood coming out. i got to hurry up because we've got to go commercial. But this is funny. And Bill C Sweeney sitting there and he says, if my wife Angie ever phoned, oh, yeah. he says, I'd buy for the whole house. Ring. <laughs> Hello, yes, Bill, it's Angie. For the house. <laughs> we have a it was almost like a setup, but yeah. it wasn't. It was an accident at home. Oh, we had a lot of fun. You realize we've got to go now. It's unbelievable.